What's going on guys, Brentsville 31 appreciate you guys tuning in. So today we got a special little video, kind of piggybacking off some of the uh, Vietnam era uniforms and gear videos that we've done in the past. But this is a topic that both Bruce and I are very intimately in love with, and that is the uh, history and development of Tiger Stripe Camouflage. Now a lot of people have an idea of what Tiger Stripe Camouflage is, but I think, and Bruce would probably concur with this, that most people when they think of Tiger Stripe Camouflage, they just get an idea in their head and they don't really know the history and how many different variations of the pattern there are out there. Um, let me just start by saying that Tiger Stripe Camouflage was not an officially issued United States military uniform. It was the uh, uniform that was worn by the South Vietnamese and a lot of our uh, advisors and special forces like LERP, SEALs, you know, SOG and all those type of units were the ones that were wearing these types of uniforms and they got them from local tailors. It, it was not an officially issued uniform to U.S. military personnel. And uh, today we're going to kind of talk about that. Bruce is a little bit more spun up on the history of this particular camouflage pattern um, than I am. So I'm going to turn it over to him here in a minute. Uh, but I just want to start by saying that the South Vietnamese developed this pattern off of the French lizard pattern. So when, you know, Vietnam was French Indochina, you know, a lot of the uh, French troops that were in country were using French lizard pattern. And this is the uh, camouflage that essentially uh, developed off of that particular pattern. And uh, there's a lot of different variations, guys. There's actual books created just to this specific topic. So we can't obviously cover everything, uh, but we do have a few things out here. So we got these laid out and we're gonna go over some of these patterns. So with that being said, let's turn it over to Bruce. What you got, man? Okay, yeah, uh, I'll just go ahead and kick it off by, on my side by saying that, yeah, the, no one really knows exactly where this pattern started. We know it came from the French lizard, but all of a sudden black started being added to it. Tiger stripes, one of those patterns that you know it when you see it, but like Brent said, not that many people understand how in-depth it is. Neither did I until I started researching it a little bit and went down that rabbit hole, which is deep, <laughs> man. It's yeah. deep. There's big discussions and arguments. I went over today just 175 pages of a forum over on the U.S. Military Forum, just kind of getting spun up on it myself just for this video. So we're going to just brush over three Vietnam-era patterns and uh, there were many more than that, but we're going to talk about probably three of the most common or popular within U.S. forces and look at the differences between those and um, kind of talk about a little bit about the development of it. But if this is something that you're interested in, if you're here because you're interested in it, yeah, start doing the research on your own. Like Brent said, there's books on it, there's internet forums on it, Facebook pages and all that stuff, and you can just you can go down that same rabbit hole and find me down there somewhere because I'm still learning <laughs> myself. New things constantly pop up, and what people thought were rules 10 years ago sometimes change, and you find out all oh, that that did exist or it didn't exist or whatever. So, um, yeah, that's part of the fun of collecting and studying this military stuff. But, you know, it's, these Vietnam patterns um, have always been influential of me just growing up, just post-Vietnam with all the TV shows. You had this stuff was featured in Apocalypse Now, and tour of duty and there's just a bunch of uh, uh, 84 Charlie Mopec, a bunch of cool old war films about Vietnam where you had some special teams or some special units that were wearing this pattern and that's really where my interest and love came from. So um, we'll start off by saying the first pattern was the VNMC or Vietnamese Marine Corps. They were the first ones to adopt the pattern and uh, like Brent said all these were made somewhere other than the United States. They could have been made in uh, uh, Japan or Vietnam, uh, there were a few made in Malaysia, uh, there were some made uh, in, in other uh, Asian countries, and a lot of those, uh, the material was made there, and then the material was sent to Vietnam, and it was sewn by local tailors. Some of them, they were produced in other countries, like Japan, and then sent over as complete uniforms, and uh, sometimes they're sized in Asian sizes, sometimes they're sized in U.S. sizes, and those are different, like an Asian medium is more like a u.s small or extra small um well, sort of like we deal with clothes sometimes today out of asia yeah it's still that's yeah, still true still true it's still true <laughs> but um anyway that's uh that's one of the things to kind of kind of remember that's kind of surprising is that every time you see a picture of someone wearing tiger stripe that uniform was not made or issued to them they acquired it somewhere else and you would see it with uh special teams like brent said like LERP Special Forces, uh, some SOG, um, uh, some SEALs for sure, but uh, also you would see it with some auxiliary units. It was very popular among 
helicopter crews and helicopter pilots. You see that a lot. And uh, even sometimes uh, more ancillary groups than that. But uh, we'll start off with the earliest pattern that we have is the uh, silver pattern. So let me go down this rabbit hole too. There's two names for almost every pattern. Up until the 1980s, they all the collectors went by one set of sort of understood names. And then a guy named Johnson came out with a book called Tiger Patterns, and he's kind of the only guy with a decent book. And so everyone goes and gets the book. Well, he renamed everything using his own names, and it made it super confusing for everybody. And so now one guy will go, oh, that's tadpole sparse. And then another guy goes, no, that's silver. Well, they're both right. They're just using two different names for the same pattern. And that can be something that's confusing you when you start researching this. So we thought in this video, at least for these three patterns, we would cover both names so that whether you're going by Johnson's names that he made up, okay, you'll understand what we're talking about. Or if you're going by the names that all of the older collectors went by, well, then you'll know what they're talking about too because they can be listed both ways or, or either way. So the first pattern we've got, which is Johnson would call it tadpole sparse or TDS for short, and everybody else would call it a silver pattern. And uh, because when it fades, it fades to a, a, a gray or silver color. The greens and browns fade to a gray or silver color. Um, so let's go over and look a little closer at the pattern. Yeah, let's check uh, it let's out. It. Okay, so this is a set that's a reproduction that more Militaria carries. It's a very good reproduction. Um, it is one of the best available on the market today. You notice that it's sized USL. These were typically stamped right here or sometimes on the collar. And obviously that's a U.S. large. It's, it's a U.S. size. Um, the Asian sizes would, would be marked differently and it would say like, uh, you know, small, medium, large, whatever. But sometimes it would say AL or AS, I think. Um, but this material, now these Tiger uniforms, these Tiger suits came in two basic materials uh, that you will see them produced in. And this is just across the board. A very lightweight material, which is all, almost so thin that you wouldn't think it would be suitable for a combat uniform. And uh, they didn't last very long. They would, they would tear and wear out pretty quick. Or a heavier weight material, more like this one that feels a little bit, uh, obviously more durable, more what you would expect from a, from, a, from a military uniform. I would liken this, for those of you that really haven't held this in your hands, more like the heavier BDU material, the heavier woodland material from the 80s. Not the exact same, but just to give you an idea of kind of how that feels. Um, you'll notice that there's, there's two breast pockets with two buttons each. That was very common. Buttons could be uh, black or green, but typically were green. And you've got no below the waist pockets. These were really designed to be tucked in, although they may be tucked in, they may be not. That's just up to the wearer as to how they wanted to, to wear those. Um, button cuffs with a nice gusset on the end of the sleeve. They have a hanger for, uh, to hang, you know, like you would hang your clothes there. And uh, these would have a, what we call like a cigarette pocket on the side. And that's pretty small, although those sea rat cigarettes were pretty small also, but just a small pocket there. You could, you could put, you know, whatever you wanted to in that pocket. Same thing on the uh, trousers here. You see you got the side pockets, which are fairly small when you compare these to like a, a set of uh, jungle fatigues. They're not really um, pleated, fairly small pocket, dual buttons, dual buttons on the hip for the hip pockets. And then there's going to be a, another small cigarette pocket right here. And uh, this is specific to this cut. They could come in different cuts and the different cuts obviously were sewn together differently, but that's how that's how these were made. These are a button fly, but you can also find examples that are a zipper fly, and these have a side or waist tab adjustments, and you can also find examples that are without the waist tab adjustments, just depending on what the cut of the uniform happens to be. And let's look at boonies also. Boy, these, these came in all kinds of shapes and sizes. Uh, they, they may have different types of vent holes. They may have foliage loops or they may be without. The liners are sometimes black on these like this one. 
and sometimes they're not. Some have a wide brim like this one. Some have a shorter brim like this. And of course, it wasn't uncommon for the user to cut the brim down even shorter if they wanted to. And that could be custom done at a local by a local tailor, or they could just take a pair of scissors and cut it off and let it let it fray out if they wanted. Also, uh, when we're talking about headgear, berets. Berets were actually somewhat common in a lot of units. You'll see, uh, you'll see them wearing tiger stripe berets. Uh, it just, again, became, came down to user preference, preference of what was available at the time. Okay, so the pattern that I'm wearing, we've only got one set of this, so you're just going to have to deal with me modeling it for you. Um, this is what everybody loves is John Wayne, right? Where, the John Wayne pattern. Where did the John Wayne name came, come from? Well, they didn't call it that during Vietnam because John Wayne, the movie, um, the Green Berets didn't come out until later on in the Vietnam War. So this pattern predates the movie. So it wasn't always called John Wayne. That's just the name that was given to it in Johnson's book. Typically it's referred to as just your classic pattern. What you're gonna notice on this pattern is that um, it's got wide black stripes and the distance between the horizontal black stripes is wider and there's more bold and there's more contrast on your early patterns this is a general rule it's not it's not a constant rule it's a general rule the wider the patterns the earlier it is the tighter smaller the pattern the later it is throughout the war throughout the years one pattern was a slight derivative of the next and it, as generations of patterns went by they seemed to get compressed and the more horizontally smaller and narrower so that's just kind of a general rule so if you see those big wide dispersed um, shades of black of stripes of black it's probably either going to be VNMC, which is again Vietnam Marine Corps, which was one of the first patterns ever, or uh, one of the classic patterns. And if you study photos, some units got this pattern, some got the other pattern. It just depended on what was available at the time. But this was named uh, by Johnson, and what a lot of newer collectors are calling it the John Wayne pattern. There's both dense and there's sparse, but John Wayne because this is the pattern that was used in the movie The Green Berets when John, which John Wayne was, was start, start in, talking about uh, U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War. And there were a lot of guys that watched the movie and went on to join the military. It was kind of a gung-ho, uh, feel-good American movie about us doing great things over there in uh, foreign lands. But uh, anyway, that's where the name of it came from. This is also a more military uh, uh, reproduction, and it's a beautiful reproduction. If you notice, even some of the, the color, the black, this is gonna fade. There's a little blue in there. You're gonna get a little blue. Sometimes they would fade that way. It all would just depend on how they were washed and cared for when in the field. Okay, so uh, the third pattern, Vietnamese, uh, Vietnam pattern that we've got is the gold. And it gets its name from this mustard yellow color to almost a tannish brown color that would normally be a green or an olive color. And it gives it this sort of golden look both sides of collectors will call it gold or advisor sparse gold depending on the cut and um it was made uh this particular set is a reproduction set that was made by soldier of fortune or sof out of uh, the uk i believe but um in any route it's got all the same features as the other uh uniforms that we looked at with the the dual buttons uh the gusseted cuffs the tuckable shirts uh, the only difference with this is just the color itself. This uh, color was, you didn't see this uh, that much. It was around from about 69 to 72, so it was a short-lived variation of Tiger Stripe. But it's one of those that really stands out because the more this fades, the lighter and more gold that it gets. And you would not think that this would blend in that well in a jungle environment, but there's two things to be said about that. that. One, it blends in better than you would think. And two, much of Vietnam was not triple canopy. There was huge portions of Vietnam that were uh, much browned, more browned and tanned depending on the seasons and depending on where uh, the, the location it, with, within Vietnam that the soldiers were uh, patrolling. And I've seen photos of it in areas that it looked fantastic. It would blend in 
better than some of these other colors. So at any rate, um, that's the third pattern, your golds. And uh, this is actually one of my favorite patterns. So lastly, let's look at what's not a Vietnam era pattern, really. Uh, there's a lot of Tiger Stop. It's a super popular pattern. It's been reproduced ever since Vietnam was over all the way up until today. You can still go online or you go to probably your local Army Navy surplus store and they probably got some of these reproductions brand new in stock. The, the problem is, is that they're typically in a, a BDU cut or a more modern cut. This one's actually in the Vietnam style fatigue cut. And there were a few tiger stripe uniforms in that cut that, that were made in that cut. But uh, you can see this is made of a ripstop material. You really didn't have ripstop during the Vietnam War, not at least while the U.S. involvement was there. There's some disagreement as to whether it existed very late war for the Vietnamese, but we know it didn't uh, exist prior to 1973 when the U.S. had pretty much so gotten out of, out of Vietnam. Um, it's also a very dark color, uh, and you notice that the stripes are very narrow, which tells you that it's a bit of a copy of almost like a Taiwanese pattern that was used at the very end of the Vietnam War. It's darker with these very, very narrow black stripes. And that just, just indicates that it was a post-war or a copy of a very late war type uniform. But typically, if you're going to be doing uh, any type of collecting, particularly uh, U.S. Uh, used tiger stripe uniforms, you're going to stay away from anything that's rip stop. All right, guys, well, that completes this video over the Vietnam-era tiger stripe camouflage pattern. If you're liking what you're seeing, don't forget to check out my channel and subscribe. Both Bruce and I are definitely going to be doing more videos over Vietnam-era gear and equipment. It's a big interest of ours, and we definitely enjoy doing these. Bruce, you got anything else to throw out, man? Yeah, we're going to be spending lots more money <laughs> and buying lots yeah. more stuff. So uh, we're definitely interested in doing more videos. And, and, and these are turning out so well, and we're getting such great feedback both from our younger viewers and a lot of you vets that are out there that I know are tuning into this stuff. Appreciate you. We, we appreciate both groups of you. Awesome. And to piggyback off that, if you are a Vietnam era veteran and you got a hold of some Vietnam era tiger stripe uniforms, please share with us how you obtained those in country. We definitely would like to hear that story. So. Any stories you got because everybody's got a, a cool background story on how they got their tigers. All right, guys. Well, that completes this video. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to leave a comment.